Northwest. Thanks for being here. Uh, and it's good to be back myself, as you may have noticed. I've, I've uh, been absent for the last uh, year on sabbatical and uh, collecting uh, data on forests and perspectives from around the world, from Nevada to Finland to uh, New Zealand. So uh, I'm, I'm trying to come, come back and uh, bring the, those perspectives uh, here uh, with renewed uh, vim and vigor. And in my absence, oh, not necessary. Save, save, save the applause for the next item, because in my absence, it was Dr. Bruce Bidgood who kept the train on track. Thank you, Bruce. <laughs> Both in terms of chairing uh, the, the Northwest uh, campus for UNBC, but also in uh, having a again a stimulating season of, uh, of public presentations and, and public lectures. You know, for those of us who have spent most of our our lives either at school uh, as students or at school as instructors, uh, September is like the new year for us, right? You know, everything is uh, is bright and new and full of positive resolutions. So. It's a, it's a fun time of year, and, and hopefully the, the weather cooperates a little. We seem to switch into winter a little faster than usual here. Um, just some updates on, on UNBC Northwest uh, events uh, since, since you're here. Uh, we have a full cohorts of, of uh, new nursing students, uh, nursing, and uh, under the leadership of Amy Klepitar here, is sort of hitting up half our student body these days. So we're really meeting a demand in the, in the health sciences uh, in the community here. Uh, we're also trying to launch a Bachelor of Commerce degree, a business degree that will hopefully start up next fall. Again, thanks to Bruce for initiating that program. And we're also hoping to start a Simshan language revitalization program in Prince Rupert. Uh, we're just waiting for enough people to sign on the dotted line and that might even start in the, in the new year. So, lots of successes and new initiatives at UNBC Northwest. <coughs> So, uh, with that preamble, I'd like to introduce you to our guest speaker. Chibuike uh, Onwukwe is a PhD student studying with Dr. Peter Jackson in environmental sciences uh, based at the Prince George campus. But uh, Chibuike has been out here for two, three summers now, working in the uh, Kitimat area and doing the modeling of the, uh, of the topic of the day. Uh, he did his undergraduate in, in Nigeria, he's a native of Nigeria, did his master's in France, and he's been in Canada and BC for about the last three years. So without further ado, I'll let you take the floor on this topic that is of great interest to a lot of our local residents. Thank you, Phil. <laughs> uh, it gives me a pleasure to be amongst you. Uh, because uh, this is uh, kind of, I think, the third time I've been in the Terrace Kitima area doing my studies, but each time I come, I'm not able to see Phil. But now I'm uh, happy that uh, I'm able to see him I also organize this uh, presentation. So uh, my topic is on atmospheric quality and illustration of the Terrace Kitima Valley. But before I go ahead fully, uh, just to give you a rundown of what I'm going to talk about, First, I'll have to explain what uh, acidifying air pollutants are, because that's the, what I really want to look into. And then uh, discuss what uh, the state of the air quality is at the moment, as in, in the recent years. Okay, what we know about the air quality in Terrace Kitma area. And also talk about what I intend doing, okay, with emissions, with uh, the uh, industries that are coming in, with the new developments are coming in, uh, how they relate to the air we breathe. And then uh, I'll leave uh, you guys to kind of make your own suggestions and also raise your own comments. So first of all, uh, when we talk about uh, pollutants, there are a, a class of pollutants we call the uh, acidifying pollutants. Now these pollut acidifying pollutants are mainly oxides of nitrogen and sulfur dioxide. And when they get in touch, uh, contact with water or with uh, other oxidizing uh, substances, they kind of tend to form more acidic uh, uh, materials. And these uh, materials now go into the environment and cause all sorts of problems. But whenever we talk about pollution, uh, what comes to our mind is uh, emissions, okay? Now, if we have more emissions, then we have more pollu uh, pollution. But we also have other factors. First is about the uh, wind, 
in the wind characteristics in, uh, in the environment. Uh, because if uh, we have low wind speeds or, uh, you know, um, uh, and also the direction of the wind where it's, you know, carrying the pollutants to then, if you are lying on that part, maybe if you are your property or your residence on the, on the part where the wind is blowing, then you, you, you are more exposed. And also we have uh, what we call chemical transformation. That's some of these pollutants, then we, when they are released, uh, what they what they bring out is not what it was when at the point of origin. So we have, uh, you know, uh, something like, uh, let's say for sulfur dioxide, it can react with oxygen and then uh, form acids. So also uh, uh, carbon, carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is, very, is a very toxic uh, substance, but with time it loses its toxicity and forms carbon dioxide. Uh, but then, we also have what we call losses because by the time the pollutants go into uh, the atmosphere, okay, at a point they kind of start settling down, right? Uh, they kind of get you know, on, the, on the ground surface and um, either because the, the precision has washed, you know, trying to wash it out and then uh, get into streams and get into uh, the larger ecosystems. So when we talk about emissions, CI yeah, emission is a, a prob is a is a kind of factor. Even for the emissions, we also kind of talk about the emission characteristics, right? Because uh, it depends if the if the pollutants are being released very close to the ground or you know at the at the upper levels. Even when you have a tall stack, then you, you find that probably uh, the pollutants are kind of being emitted at a higher layer, so it doesn't really affect uh, the human beings, you know, their health. So these are things we are kind of, kind of trying to bring into it together to kind of study and uh, see what the results are producing. So just to kind of drive home what I'm saying, you have different sources of pollutants, right? You have the industries, okay? And you have different classes, okay? You have uh, the what we call VOC, these are volatile organic compounds. They are, they are you know, when, uh, especially with um, the petroleum uh, processing industries, they have this kind of vapors, you know, isoprene, ethane, uh, terpenes, they go off. You also have, um, but another th thing we have to know that even without uh, the, you know, industries polluting or what, uh, our own houses and roads, we also have emissions from, from vegetation, which is very important. Uh, the vegetation is a source of uh, VOCs. And when we talk about ozone, you know, uh, ozone concentration, this VOC is very important because it's it, the, the concentration of uh, nitrogen oxides and VOCs uh, determine the concentration of ozone. And ozone is another uh, harmful pollutant because ozone is supposed to be uh, very at the higher levels of the atmosphere. But sometimes, you, uh, because of uh, emissions, you know, uh, the combination of VOC and, no, uh, and nitrogen oxides, we find them at lower concentrations where they are not supposed to be. So once they are kind of occurring at the level humans, uh, it becomes uh, a problem. Then, Apart aside that, by the time, like I said, uh, there are losses, which is called deposition. Deposition doesn't uh, really, uh, you know, we, uh, deposition can occur uh, because of uh, rain washing down these pollutants into the streams, into the soils. But even without rain or snow, we still have deposition because some of these uh, um, acids are also, uh, uh, you know, they are, they are in gaseous form. So without, the, without a precipitation of snow, we see how the position, they just kind of, you know, settle on their own and get in contact with soils. So, uh, already we know that, uh, you know, like even before I started, in fact, what really encouraged me to start looking into this area in particular was some of the issues, you know, with um, Rio Tinto and all that, uh, people kind of coming out to say they have been affected. It's uh, based on, on pollutants uh, within this area. 
And uh, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a big issue when you have so much of, say, let's say, uh, fine particulates. Tiny particles are very invisible, okay, you, because you can breathe it, okay? And these particulates, they are not, not, not that they are, they are just particles, maybe dust. They contain several other uh, materials in them. Let's say like uh, lead, lead particles. You can find it in, 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 in PM 2.5. Uh, mercury, uh, chromium, sulfates, all these are embedded in it. So by the time you are inhaling it, uh, it becomes a, a big uh, mental, uh, you know, it creates a, a, a big mental problem. So sometimes uh, you go into the hospital, they, 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 they organize, oh, you have uh, cancer, you have uh, uh, asthma and uh, respiratory symptoms. And then you spend more money, spend more money, and eventually the person goes. And yeah, so the person is dead, right? So, but what's the cause? It's, it's coming from uh, the air we breathe. So it becomes very important that uh, these um, uh, pollutants are kind of strictly regulated. Uh, there, are, uh, there are standards, right? There are limits um, that has been earmarked for most of these pollutants. But the fact remains that even whatever the standard uh, limit is, we are all different, right? We have different, uh, uh, our bodies are different. No two people are the same, health-wise. So you may be, have that kind of tolerance. Uh, one person may have a tolerance for pollutants at a level, but another person is maybe due to genetic factors, right? The person is uh, more uh, vulnerable. So we have, within groups, you have uh, large uh, vulnerabilities range of vulnerabilities. So that aside, the health impact. Now we are talking about the, uh, the impacts on, on the ecosystem, which is on, on uh, the fishes, aquatic life. OK, like I said, the, uh, the position is a very big factor. Not that they make the, the streams can become more acidic, or the soils can become more acidic and less productive, OK? But the fact is that they can release because they, they, there's a balance within these ecosystems. So if, if you have more, more chemicals, like in water, they can release a more you know, toxic uh, substances, especially with, uh, in, the, in the waters, in lakes. You have this, uh, if, if it becomes more acidic, there's substances like aluminum, kind of, you know, they are start oozing out into the, the water body, and this affects fishes. Also for the vegetation, like if, they, if here is kind of a bit uh, mountainous, it's mountainous, right? And you have sometimes the clouds sitting very, very close to the surface, right? And if the cloud is kind of, you know, have acidic substances within the clouds, and they are kind of uh, impacting on the terrain, you find that even at the top of the are the ridges, the mountains, it, it starts going bare, right? Because it, it kind of starts uh, uh, impacting on the vegetation. So it becomes, a, you know, health-wise, we have, uh, it becomes a risk, and also for the ecosystem, for the fishes, for the uh, farmlands, for the, uh, um, you know, tourist areas we have here, you know, the paradise we live, uh, it becomes a problem. Now, historically, uh, we, we, we've not had these issues, right? That's, we are not supposed to be talking about uh, as, as, acidification within uh, terrace kitima area because it, it's, been, it's been kind of uh, relatively isolated, okay? What we be having problems with um, acid deposition and pollution mainly is uh, in the east of uh, Canada because we have this uh, transboundary pollutants coming from the U.S., from New York, from uh, Massachusetts, and, you know, getting into Ontario and Quebec. And also, we have these large cities, you know, people, industries, and coming in there. But the fact remains that uh, the, uh, a, a, you know, Canada, Canada is a country, is apportioned into the areas of susceptibility uh, to the position based on underlying soil, formation. There are places 
that have, you know, they, they, they have a high tolerance for acidification, especially in the prairies here, because they are underlain by, you know, uh, calcium carbonates. Okay, these are kind of um, a neutral, they neutralize acids. But here, um, you know, in the in southern Quebec, Ontario, also in the uh, northern parts, the, the soil is underlain by, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a more kind of acid uh, prone soils, right? So if we have pollutants settling here, acid pollutants settling, the impacts are more because of the industrialization. But here, you know, due to the fact that we don't have much industries as, you know, until the recent times. So the, uh, we, we are now kind of not, we are kind of less immune, uh, you know, before now. But the fact is means that with the coming of these industries, it might be a case that uh, we have to start facing the problems uh, people in southern uh, Quebec and Ontario have, have been facing for a, a, a lot of years, okay? We, there we, we, you know, in the areas of Hamilton and um, uh, Lake Huron, you know, there, there's a lot of issues going on there with acidification. So we don't really want that for our community, right? So that's why it becomes necessary to kind of start estimating what is actually coming into our ecosystem now so that I can plan for it as these industries are about to come in and see how uh, the uh, regulations can be more enforced or uh, their operations can be restricted to also preserve the paradise we have here. So why is this place very interesting? Of course, you guys know, should know more than me here, <laughs> okay? Uh, we have a very high precision. Like I said, uh, uh, precision is one of the factors that cause, uh, you know, the deposition of pollutants, because if you have a uh, high precision, then more of it will be washed down to the soils and the streams. We are getting like up to, is it like 220, uh, 220 centimeter of uh, precision per year in kitty mats, then like 130 centimeter around terrace. So by the time we are going towards the south, you know, the, the, we have very um, snowfall. They have variable wind speeds, right? Because, because of the terrain we have, because it's very heterogeneous, right? Uh, the the uh, valley, the highlands, the ridges, so it creates a, a lot of variability. I'll still go into this here more in some detail uh, as we go along. But the, the fact means that because of the alignment of this valley, okay, from some of the uh, preliminary uh, results, I, a kind of analysis I did, you find that the, the valley kind of allow, aligns uh, this prevailing winds in the north-south direction. Then complex terrain. We have uh, so many uh, lakes here, so many lakes, so many creeks, so many uh, uh, inlets, okay? And that kind of complicates uh, the movement of pollutants. And then finally, going in industrialization now, they, we are hearing that in, in very soon, uh, the decision about some of the major industries will be taken. And uh, that's, and uh, what we know is that they are coming in, oh, there's uh, promises of uh, employment, you know, people get richer, people, you know, live better lives and financially, and, uh, but then uh, our environment, we don't really know what that that behoves for us. So uh, these are kind of uh, because before I, I start, I need to know what actually the air quality is, so that we can know start estimating some of these emissions and what uh, the true state of air we breathe. Now this is for about uh, fine particulate matter. Fine particulate matter are very tiny particles. I live in Prince George, where we have, you know. Uh, so much trouble with uh, uh, fine particulates, you know, because of the smoke, because of the wildfires and, and all that. So, but here it's not really as bad as that, you know. As, no, I wouldn't say it's as bad, as, but it, it depends on the periods also. Like, where you, you guys were in summer, during summertime, 
uh, it, you know, where other places, other airships are complaining about high, high smoke levels. I don't think that was happening here. But in the winter, it could, it could be quite a problem here, as, as much as I'll be able to show you here. So we have provisional limits of 25 micrograms per meter cube for that hour. Um, uh, yeah, daily, uh, uh, daily limits of 25 microgram per meter cube. On an hour basis, uh, the, the limit uh, you know, for over a whole year is 8 microgram per meter cube. And we have a planning goal. That's, sometimes this planning goal is, is just like an aspiration for different uh, air sheds. You know, they work towards that goal, but most times it's not really met. And some places we don't even have bodies that are regulating, you know, that are sitting together to, you know, plan, you know, say what they want to do uh, to achieve this goal. So it just kind of becomes a, a kind of a, a wishful thinking. But what we see here is the different, um, different levels of uh, PN2.5. That's PN2.5 is uh, tiny particles less than 2.5 microns. A mic a a hair, a strand of hair is like 60 microns, just a strand of your hair. So if you imagine where uh, 30 of these particles can be joined end to end and they still fit within a strand of hair, you cannot imagine how tiny or how invisible these particles can be. So that's why they are able to kind of go into the system because you they can easily go through the nostrils and into the bloodstream and cause so many problems. So here we have uh, like five stations within the valley, uh, four uh, down Kidimat, and one here in Terrace at uh, Munro. So if I find that uh, the over a period of this, like over a period of four years, okay, because you know four years, not that we don't have much uh, data that goes back to some some other time, but because uh, from I think from 2013, because they were using an old technology to measure particulates, and that old technology wasn't really uh, capturing the VOC component of particulate matter. So now, from 2014, they, they used a, 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 a more recent technology to be measuring particulate matter, and that made us okay. Instead of trying to maybe use data that are not really comparable, so okay, let's start from 2014, but. Uh, the intention is kind of also to uh, get data up to the end of 2018, uh, 2018, which we are we have. So by the end of 2018, we can have at least a five-year record of what the trend has been. So we find that Hesla Village, where we have the reserve, okay, this is uh, what is kind of trend tending towards, and on an annual basis, tending towards, uh, you know, uh, the 10. A microgram mark, but the, the annual is the limit is like eight. So, as of 2018, I think, uh, 2017, sorry, it was higher than that uh, eight microgram, which is a limit, the provisional limit. So, you find uh, already one station uh, in uh, further south is kind of having, uh, you know, has exceeded its limits for, for PN 2.5. Hall Road, which is, I think that station is um, just a lot of the industrial layout in Kilimat. Uh, yeah, is that? Yeah, this uh, the, the 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 second one here. Yeah, the second one here. Yes, yeah, you are right. So Hall Road, which is this, is just a, a lot of of uh, the layout. So you have a a, a declining trend in PM two point five. And when I checked uh, the the emission limits for all these years, I found that it was it has been kind of falling steadily. So it might be because the the reduction they have been having a consistent reduction in the emission. That's I'm talking about Rio Tinto, the guys over there that are main the main industrial polluters. It could be that this has actually been reflecting. The River Lodge, uh, which is the third one here, you see here is um is. Is an is um, a residential uh, suburb, so uh, the it has fallen maybe because that that station, you know, is the next station after Hall uh, Road is 
river lodge if you are going towards the north. But then it's a residential area. So it, it's not, it, it fell, but not as much. So they are kind of doing pretty good. But what I observe in river lodge is that I, I don't think that area is really built up as, as, as white seal. Okay, because River Lodge is kind of, um, you know, the other part of the Kitima town. But why say this? You have a lot of residences, a lot of, and also the monitor, where that monitor cited is, is kind of sort of a cumbad by here. So there, there might not be a much dispersion of pollutants in Waisei compared to uh, River Lodge. Then Terrace, Terrace is here. Well, terrace is, you know, because of the benches we have, is we get to see this later on. But the it has so much variability in in, in the PM two point five uh, uh, concentrations. It is it, always fluctuating because uh, pro probably because of the inversion, you know, it, because it's sitting in in a very low lying area compared to its surroundings. Another thing I noticed was that there were so many gaps. So and today started just a monitoring started here in 2015. So we don't have as much data as compared to other stations. So probably by the end of the 2018, that's this year, we can have more data to kind of be more certain as what is happening in Terrace. But note that Terrace uh, for last year, they, they have a spike, okay? Uh, that's 2017, they, there, there was an upward trend in Fine particulate matter for terrace. Now these are the similar variations for PM because one thing is that also what I where I are interested in this is how you know during the daytime we are we carry out all our outdoor activities, right? In the nighttime we retire to our homes. But if you are outdoors, okay, doing your chores and all, how does this kind of you know reflect in your daily lives? So you have that the Heisler village site for this is a winter, this is a fall. So winter and fall, if I follow the stations, winter and fall are kind of the more uh, severe uh, concentrations we are having. That's why I said in, in summer, you guys kind of you know, have better air quality, I think. But during winter, when a lot of homes are you know, trying to keep warm, and also uh, the inversions and all that. So it, it kind of have a spike. And also when you look at terrace, like I said, terrace uh, during the daytime, okay, this is the hour. During the daytime, it, it kind of is low, but uh, by nighttime it has a spike, which we don't even really see in other sessions, okay? And then, but for other stations, um, mostly is during the, the fall period, especially in November, October, November, we have, we have uh, high concentrations of particulate matter for other stations. But for Hesla Village, uh, they are the reserve, their, their highest concentrations come during winter. So, and, and as I last say, they were exceeding that eight microgram meter limit for PM 2.5. So this uh, further, uh, because wh where we kind of try to relate this, because we need wind data, right, to see what is actually happening uh, with all these uh, stations. Um, like I said, where River Lodge, because R White Sail and River Lodge, they are residential areas in Kitimat. But where River Lodge is, it's kind of a, a more, it's not really encumbered by, I, I mean, it's, South of this place, you are going towards the Douglas Channel. So uh, the, the, you have the winds coming here from the south, especially in, the, in summertime, the winds come from the south. But for white sail, because you have these kind of uh, ridges, it's kind of more enclosed, and you have so many buildings there. So probably the air is not, be, you know, the, the dispersion is not as, as uh, improved as where you have a river lodge because river lodge, not much people and not um, and the, the 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 wind speed. You're having a, a large amount of wind speed around river lodge. Like we are getting up to five six meter per second wind speed, but in in um, in white sail, it's just like around three meter per second. 
So it's kind of, I think that place hasn't, it's not getting enough uh, air as supposed to be. But we're in, in Hesla village for winter because winter, by winter, in during summer, the wind comes from the south. But in winter, the uh, winter, the wind comes from the north because of the air flows from the inside and the interior. So what you see here are the elevated concentrations. That's, these are concentrations above 8 micrograms per meter cube at uh, Hesla village site. And this is just telling us that it seems because we are, we have this um, shaded portions in the case where the, the concentrations are lying. So it seems that probably the, from uh, there's a lot of um, residential wood bonds around this area, but we, we are not really certain for these uh, portions because also further north we have this, you know, we have the industries, okay, in Regento, then you have uh, kind of, you know, the shipping and also the marina here. So this might also be kind of contribute, contributing to what we, we are having at Hesla village site. But we are not really kind of sure because uh, these are just single point monitoring, right? Just at one point. So that gives us, you know, brings us to our, our limitations. Uh, why, uh, you know, why do we want to do further work? First of all, the air quality, air quality monitors are just single point data, right? Just a few observation points we have, just like five, and we'll have a, a very long valley. Then the, the pollutants we are monitoring is, is few. Apart from PM2.5, the stations monitor like uh, sulfur dioxide, uh, nitrogen oxide, um, ozone. You just say few stations monitor ozone, like two or three. But apart from that, we don't, uh, there are several countless pollutants we don't even know about, but they also impact on health. Let's talk about the maybe benzene, which is a, a form of a volatile organic uh, compounds. Benzene, uh, um, isoprene, we have even the mercury, okay? Mercury, uh, tiny mercury metals that can get into it. We have uh, lead, lead, because lead uh, in, in the environment is so poisonous, okay? So we don't even know about all these pollutants, but these are what we're able to monitor at these few sites. Then, I, like I said, the elevated concentration, when I get back to the uh, former slide, I say we have an elevated concentration at, at this high slash site, but who are we to blame, okay? No, we, how do we apportion blame? I mean, we, 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 it's, it seems, uh, you know, the residents here are, are doing something, you know, they are, they're concerned, the wood bonds are so high. We also have, um, you know, contributions from further upwind, right? So, but with the data we are having, we, we can't really say, you know, uh, who, who, who someone responsible, all that kind of thing. Now, and also, as to what difficult, what we now know is what is happening, right? But with the coming of industry, with the coming of development, we need to be more certain of, of how the future for both for us. I've been going around preaching the gospel of popular. Um, thanks for um, a few of us here that have been, been willing to get, uh, provide their property and also uh, for their Wi-Fi to be used to communicating data, uh, real-time data. Uh, these are very inexpensive sensors. You can get it installed in your, in your, in your house that's to measure ambient air quality and also keep uh, updated as to what the air quality is around your area. It's very nice, but we are, it's not, you can go to the market and get maybe a unit for like 250, uh, 250 dollars and get installed. But I have a couple more I can give to anyone that is willing to have it. Uh, especially I'm looking at somewhere like, because this was set up, uh, the popular monitors one is, is at Lakers, one is at uh, White Seal. But in between here, we still need some data, you know, especially around the cable, cable car. 
or maybe somewhere around Onion Lake, and somewhere around um, at the High Slide Village. I'm very interested in someone having that in the High Slide Village area. It just uses Wi-Fi you know, to report to that uh, some of us here might, might have got information about this, so it's not something that is new. I also give real-time data. You just <laughs> log in, you see it on the map. You, it's just like you're going to a very, um, BC air quality website, and you see the data. It's just it's, it's there. Also measures uh, temperature, humidity, and um, and um, I think three temperature, humidity, and uh, one other variable. But it doesn't give wind speed. That's one other limitation because wind speed and wind direction is very important for us. So that gives leads us to into modeling now. Because in, in modeling, we are now not looking at just one data point or a few data points. We are trying to see, to have a snapshot of what everywhere looks like in terms of air quality. Okay? And this needs a several inputs. You have to take input about the meteorology, about uh, the terrain. Like I said, terrain, because the terrain has vegetation on it. And vegetation is a contributor to some classes of pollutants. So you have to take in this terrain. You have to take in emissions from, you know, from your house, from the railways, from, uh, from your vehicle, from your lawnmowers, from uh, quarry sites. Mix all of them into a model, and it gives us a, 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 you know, a snapshot, snapshot of what the air quality is at every point in the valley. So to do that, we are trying to, because these data sets are not at the scale we, we, we want, because we are trying to get, you know, get uh, information uh, for a very rugged terrain. But the data sets uh, we are having at, at the very large scale, so we kind of try to grid, grid, grid uh, this data set to, to that point, which is the Tereskitima Valley here. And once we get that, we now start looking at how the model is performed. Because sometimes you, you see reports, you, you go through reports, you know, oh, they pre give their predictions, give their estimates. But how, uh, how confident do we know that this data is actually reliable? You know, when, even when, like sometimes you, oh, you tend to forecast. They tell you, oh, it's going to rain, right? Or it's going to snow, or it, the temperature will be like, you know, so cold. But when, you, when, when it happens, you know, you find that there's a kind of, uh, a kind of offset to what has been predicted. So we're also interested to know how this model is, is, is going to pay for whatever. So it's very important we compare our, you know, our results with actual observations and to see how it's. So the preliminary results we are having, it, it, it shows that it's quite OK. I mean, they, 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 we are having, you know, I won't want to go into detail about this, but we still kind of try to compare our results with real with you know, observations that are done at several uh, sites, even up to out there in the Douglas Channel. We are trying to get all these comparisons and see how the models. But so the, the the results we are getting is 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 very good, and it gives us confidence that we can use uh, the tools we have to. It's kind of now look, get the, the air quality at every point and also the position at every point. Now, this is a very big job. So we, another thing we are trying to do now is now trying to get inventory of every pollutant, whatever the source, we are getting the inventory of every pollutant. So the point, when you say uh, the uh, point emissions, these are emissions are from the industries, some of, some of them, have been you know, captured in the, in the emissions inventory of the provincial emissions inventory, also Canada-wide. Then uh, the area sources. Area sources are like your homes, uh, the, uh, like where, when I, I was at the Hesla village site, we had this uh, marina. So you have these recreational vessels, right? And they are just clustered around one point. So these are kind of Sources coming from a certain area, they are, they are grouped together. So we can now take the emissions into account. 
Then mobile uh, sources are your vehicles, um, also the, the uh, vehicles and um, motorbikes, the rail, okay? All things that move along a certain path, we get them. Also the biogenic emissions, biogenic are the vegetation, like I said, they meet uh, uh, pollutants. So we get all this at the layer we want, which is the first layer, that's the ground layer, because that's where the air you, you and I breathe, that's at that layer that we breathe, you know. So the first one was for carbon, uh, sulfur dioxide. I know this has been an issue around here with the industries. One is uh, nitrogen oxide. Then this one is fine particulate matter. Okay, and this one is carbon, carbon monoxide, which I say is very toxic because it, it shuts down if, if you inhale it uh, for a long time, it shuts down the whole respiratory system. So now, uh, the next thing is now to discuss the em emission scenarios that, uh, you know, that is going to happen here. First of all, you know that Rio Tinto just completed their modernization. That was like uh, last year or so. And they, you know, now we know that they are, they are operating at a certain level of emissions, but they've not reached that, you know, maximum limit, right? They've, like, uh, the, the last time I checked the emissions for 2017, they are doing like um, 27, uh, 27 uh, tons uh, per annum. So, but the, the upper limit is like 42 tons per annum. So we want to know what their effect is at this point and also project what if they read that for two tons per annum of sulfur dioxide what you know what 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 it could lead to okay then you have uh, two i heard that there are two uh, lng projects but i don't really know the state i, I know that the uh, kitimat lng uh, is um they, they they started work but i don't really know what is going on right there but the much more certain one is the Canada LNG, but we are also kind of trying to take it, these two LNG project, uh, projects into consideration, all the emissions. So, first of all, we know what we know, want to know what is at this point. Then with Rio Tinto, then by the time we add uh, Kitimat LNG and Canada LNG, we get to know what their effects are. And uh, two refineries I heard that are coming in here. Uh, bitumen refineries. Uh, I've, I read the, the uh, proposals they, set, they submitted to Environment Canada and the mission estimates and all the, uh, what, the, what their facilities are going to look at. So with that, we are also kind of trying to look into what the effects will be for our valley. And also, it, we are not in isolation, okay? Are they, are they, when we talk about what we are producing as a valley or as a community, you also need to look at what might happen outside the valley. Like if there's a development in Principate, if there's a development in Smithers, if there's a development in um, Stewart or whatever. So outside the valley, if there are incre uh, increasing, are increasing, how does that affect us, okay, as a people? So these are uh, the uh, estimates we've been able to work out and the, the various components. Some, some of these uh, industries have, have several components, like when you talk about the aluminum industry, you have the plant, okay? You also have the, the movement through the Douglas Channel, the number of ships that come and, you know, they, they, because they, they are burning uh, fuels, okay? And yeah, they are burning, uh, burning uh, diesel, they are shipping, so they kind of emit uh, pollutants. Then uh, you have Kitimat LNG, uh, and, and these estimates are based on the capacity, what they want to do, okay, the size of their project. So we, all the criteria pollutants, we kind of estimate based on maybe the, the number of vessels that are coming there, the, the, the export capacity, the, come in, just hold on, the export capacity, and the, the, uh, the fuel use, the power use, and all that. So, yeah? Is that, is that at the end of the completion of the project? Or is there anything else? Or all, all together? Uh, this is for during, uh, during operation. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, what, yes, during, during the operation. Yeah, yeah there's a good question. Uh, the, 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 during the construction, yes, we upset, uh, expect you know, some positions to be, but that would that, that, that be for some, year, that's for some time. Maybe the construction phase is like two, three years, and we don't really know what the, you know, the construction, f in f the positions they, they might meet. But for the whole operation, when they are put, it, it lasts long, like 20 years, 30 years. So these are kind of what you've estimated that they'll be producing. So uh, uh, then the bitumen refineries, uh, they have several components. Also, we have the plant, the shipping, because they say they will uh, export their products. And also the rail yard, where, where you have the rail yard switches, and also the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the transport of raw bitumen and the rail cars go back, back and forth a day. So we try to estimate all that, and also uh, map them out along the paths. It's not shown here, but that has been done. Yeah. Do you want to carbon dioxide in your columns at all? Yes, um, uh, that's a good question. Carbon dioxide actually is, um, is a greenhouse gas. It's not a pollutant. So um, this is just talking about uh, pollutants, not greenhouse, greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases uh, is another um, subject altogether because that's that has a, you know, it has a global effect, right? So it's not, it's not, but what is being planned is just your committee that will bear the brunt, sort of, if I should use that word. So carbonic acid it comes from carbon dioxide and water, is that the way? No, so sort of car carbon monoxide, the reaction for carbonic acid is carbon dioxide plus water, is that the way? That no, no uh, uh, it's, um, Carbon, di carbon monoxide, which is CO, we first react with oxygen to give carbon dioxide. Then with the carbon dioxide, it could react with water to give uh, carbonic acid, which is an acid. Which is an acid. It's minus, but then it's an acid gas. Yes, carbon dioxide is an acid. Carbon dioxide is acidic, it's acidic gas, but it's, it's a weak, weak, yeah, weak, yeah, it's a weak one. Yes, yes. Um, uh, we, with um, the LNG, the, the um, protocol has, because it is uh, it's expected that uh, they, they will use uh, the liquefied gas as, as fuel for the, for the carriers. So uh, the numbers here, um, the numbers here is based on you know, it, on the worst scenario, which yeah, which are they are, they are using going to use bunker fuel, okay? Because we 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 expect that maybe the ships will not use uh, 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 that's uh, natural gas as as fuel. So we expect that they based on bunker fuel or, or, or the polluting uh, gases, so that we can know the maximum limits uh, that they could have impact on. So that's that for the emission scenarios. These are, you know, the, we are, because we are trying to get the accumulated impacts if, as you're adding more projects. So, and I, I've thought about other projects I could add, but uh, I don't think there's anyone that is has in, uh, that has a concrete plan as at this moment. So, uh, just to conclude, yeah, uh, it's not, what we are trying to do is not to replace uh, the money that's uh, money. If, uh, of course, we are doing this even to know where to put monitors. Because if, like now, we, we kind of, okay, uh, there's a lot of monitoring gaps, right? A, a lot of areas are not being monitored. But where do we put the monitors? With this kind of work, we are kind of trying to see, okay, where possibly we can, you know, give uh, more attention for monitoring. Particularly where uh, maybe the the gases or uh, the uh, pollutants can deposit, and then we kind of maybe hit the terrain, and we, we, if we see those areas, we now say, okay, these are places we we want to have more monitoring, and also for the future of our valley, uh, we possibly with the resources we are getting, uh, whoever that is in charge could actually uh, make uh, more stringent. 
uh, controls in a, a proper maybe uh, stress shows that are more protect protective of uh, the valley. So I thank you for your rapt attention. Uh, I think I've taken so much time. <laughs> so thank you. You know if anybody has approached the LNG proponents about doing monitoring as well? Um, I, I don't really have idea about that because even uh, I know that every time, every year, they kind of send in their environmental assessment reports. Um, but I don't really know if they've contracted someone to do monitoring for them. I, I'm not in the know about that. Yeah? Are your slides available online or in Okay, okay, yeah, yeah I, I, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, I, I, I will make, make it available. Okay, okay I'll, I'll, I'll make, make it available because, because there are some things, some things are not really labeled, labeled here, so that, so that if, if you are reading it, you could actually make more sense of it. Okay, I'll, I'll make it available and it will be related to. It may be archived a PDF. Yeah, yeah, PDF of it, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, at some point, we can put it on our website as well. Yeah. Those numbers, how, how representative are they for places in the world and, and what the limit that our airship can take? Are we looking at 98% of the capacity of the airship before we all keel over? Are we looking at 2% or is it the same as outside of Beijing or is it the same as Prince George? Or what, what's the relative? understanding of those numbers. Okay, like um, the numbers we have here, uh, one, I, I, first of all, I had to pull, you know, numbers from uh, the, rec the most recent uh, Canadian, uh, Canada-wide inventories, and spe specifically for the shipping uh, portion uh, that I had to kind of make projection, okay, as to what has been, and also uh, because we are just part of, you know, of the whole country-wide emissions. So I kind of apportioned it using the grids. Again, uh, you also have information from the Port of Vancouver. Port of Vancouver has a more detailed inventory, so I kind of scale it. That has been scaled, especially for the maritime. Uh, emissions that would escape from the port of Vancouver, and also uh, the the emissions like if if um, a, a carrier is going along the maritime route, we have um, we have the fuel consumption. Okay, the, like you said, uh, the uh, the bunker fuel. We also have uh, the emission factors. So that has been skilled from those emission factors. Uh, then uh, for the uh, the refineries, like uh, we don't have uh, the uh, the because it's a bitumen refinery and we we don't really have much bitumen refineries. Well, we have just you know conventional refineries, but there's one refinery. Uh, uh, it's uh, I think uh, Lloyd, Lloyd Minster in Alberta. So about the capacity of that refinery is much more smaller than what we're expecting here. So that was scaled I think by ten times. Because a project is a project, right? It doesn't matter where, what, what uh, the, the site is going to be. Once it's a project, this is what is what the capacity is. We just scale it from that similar uh, project. Okay, so we have a Lloydminster uh, 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 refinery in Nabata. I scaled that, those emissions from there. And, uh, you know, based on the capacity we have, like this one, uh, here you say that they have, uh, I don't, I've forgotten the numbers, but that was skilled. Then uh, for, and all the emissions here, it's kind of, look, you know, looking at as point emissions from, you know, from the boundary of this domain up to this point. Also for the rail, 
you know, we have kind of a grid. We gridded it and then put uh, point emissions along all this rim up to the point uh, where we have the boundary of the domain. So, and also we have information from uh, Canada Rail. Uh, can we, we can, uh, they have uh, publications, they have emission factors for the fuel they are using, and also the locomotive types. So we have, uh, you know, the, uh, the, they say that soon they will phase out uh, locomotives and so, but they pass uh, historical records of emissions that have been coming from those locomotives. That's what we used to have this uh, emission of six minutes. There's no, uh, there's no way to know if uh, they are, you know, we just, just we can't place um, a, you can't place a, a limit on that because, like, uh, uh, when we talk about, for instance, for the LNG, we have LNG projects in the U.S. Okay. And if you look through their reports or their estimates, it's very different depending on the kind of uh, technology they want to use. Like I had, uh, you know, the, one of the proposals says that they might, uh, for the LNG, that they might use um, electricity. And if electricity is used, then the emissions will be lower. But this was not done based on the fact that it is, we use it based on the fact that they use uh, uh, natural gas powered plants. Okay? So, which is much more conservative, that's more protective of the environment. So there's no really a low or medium or high. We just used a kind of, you know, pro a conservative estimates to protective estimates for that. Okay, I wonder if, if we could go back to those points <coughs> you showed of the, of the distribution of the SO2 and NOx. Mm -hmm. This is probably the thing that, that most people are concerned about. So just to clarify, these are the baseline? Yeah, yeah these, these are, are the baseline. baseline. Yes. Okay. And you, yeah. the work is still in progress to assess your development scenario. Yes, yes exactly. exactly. So um, in, in, if this is the baseline, I wonder if you could just ex explain some of the patterns. I, I'm, for one, I'm surprised to see a greater concentration in Paris than in um, the Kitimat area for both pollutants. Is that related to the level of economic activity, transportation, or just the high smokestacks in, uh, in Kitimat, or why do we have this concentration in terrace? Is, is it, it for, for the, the SO2? SO2? Or or well, both of them. Both both of them. Of okay, 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 so. In terrace. Now, now uh, uh, this um, good question. We find here uh, that, you know, the blue dust means, uh, you know, there are low concentrations here, right? So these are from from the uh, residences because all emission sources have been taken into account. The points, the area, the mobile, and the biogenic. Now, uh, but you know, Kitimat doesn't have, uh, you know, compared to Terrace, Terrace is a bigger place, right, than Kitimat. But we have this point, which is, I think, it should be the Rio Tinto, um, Rio Tinto plant, which is, uh, red, okay, because showing that they have high concentration, the high emissions, high emissions. But here in um, in Terrace, uh, probably this should be maybe one of the um, uh, ray yards, or who, who knows. And also these are from the residences because wood combustion, as residential wood also gives uh, sulfur dioxide. But one thing I want to say is that this actually is for the first layer. If you see here, I have up to like 12 layers, okay? So it depends also if the, if, uh, because if I should take another layer, that's the second layer, the concentration will change. It's different from, is the second layer is different from what you see in the first layer. Also the third layer, fourth layer, fifth layer. By the, by the sixth or seventh layer, I don't see anything at all. So in, uh, most of what is emitted is, from what I, I checked, was just like up to the third or fourth layer, then you, that's, that's where you have high concentration. But and how big are the layers? What elevations? Uh, the, the maximum I'm taking is uh, 2,000 2, meters above the terrain. But each layer is about, a, about uh, 100 or 200 meters? Uh, 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 it's, it, it, it varies. It varies. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not because, because they, they are more. more 
the, the, the lowest layer is like 10 meters, then you have up to 40, then uh, 100, because we want to have more, more resolution uh, as it goes closer to the ground. Yeah? Yes, uh, we live on the uh, west side of Lake Ellis Lake, approximately halfway between the terrace and Kilimanjaro. And Rio Tinto has an air monitoring station just up the road from us. And I'm wondering if you have access to their readings that uh, we're committed to the math there. Yeah, uh, their readings are not up yet, I don't think. No, it's up, uh, uh, but it's at a different site. Uh, those readings, uh, I've seen them. I'm, I use, I'm using those uh, data from uh, uh, from the uh, from the monitoring because, but they monitor what they monitor is that the position, right? They monitor the position. They don't monitor the air concentrations. It's the position that they monitor, if I'm correct. So uh, you don't see uh, those for for uh, you know at the human level, uh, you know air quality wise. You, I mean. It's just you, you won't you won't use it for anything, but for if you are you know looking at for the position on the on the surface on, on soil or aquatic bodies, that's when it becomes relevant. So I'm using those data for my for 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 my study too, uh, but those data are not uploaded on on you know on the BC Air Quality website. They are on Castnet. A uh, Castnet, if you check Castnet or uh, uh, Aeronet, you know, there's the, the position monitoring programs. You see those data, and they have up to like five years data or six years data on on that site from Lake Els. So about your concern, I'm I'm using those data, but uh, those data are for, for strictly for deposition. The they are not for air concentrations. Well, I'm confused because I'm on the Cape with Rio Tinto. And to our knowledge, the, the SO2 monitors are not yet working. Um, at at Hollow, at Lake Health. At Lake Health? Yeah. When, when, when did they deploy, deploy that? Because I, 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 I heard they would deploy uh, new, new SO2 monitors, but I don't really know if, they've, if it's gone online. I don't know. I, I've, I've, even before coming here, I checked uh, the BC air quality monitors. I've, I've, I've not seen any monitoring from from Lake Hills, but but I know they have the position station at Lake Hills, but I'm not aware of any thing. We should probably bring the discussion to a close. If you want to uh, ask questions personally, please come up and, and ask Chimuike. But uh, let's thank him for uh, joining us today. I think this is a topic that we should be Perhaps we come back in a year or two and we have the, uh, the, the impact results as well, now that we have the tools in place to assess some of those. And to stop. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Sorry, we don't have an agenda for, uh, for public presentations for the rest of the semester. Uh, I'm still arranging speakers, so we'll get that out to you through the usual modes as well. But stay tuned. No, no, no.